the modern nation state unbound. Uh, I'll tell you what I mean by that. Um, there is a, you know, uh, remember that uh, Mary Shelley's uh, Frankenstein Uh, or the modern Prometheus. There is a there is a, uh, a Greek play called um, Prometheus Unbound. Prometheus was uh, was punished by the gods for stealing divine fire for human beings and giving people the technology of fire. Uh, he was punished and and chained to a rock where. Uh, uh, Vultures came and ate out his liver every day, um, over and over again. Um, and so, uh, uh, Prometheus is bound to this rock, but then there's a story of Prometheus being unbound and sort of uh, then, you know, uh, the scientific revolution kind of has this feeling of Prometheus unbound. And that's Mary Shelley is, is, is alluding to that in her Frankenstein's monster as a kind of Prometheus unbound, but also like knowledge unbound, like scientific technological knowledge unbound, uh, like the technology of fire that Prometheus once unbound, then starts giving humanity all sorts of technology. And the scientific revolution then seems like a, a moment of the unbinding of Prometheus. Um, and so I want to talk about uh, the enlightened modern nation state unbound or the na modern nation state unbound into a kind of enlightened um, autocracy. All right, so Frederick the Great, um, in this earlier period of the 18th century is, so we saw Louis XIV, he was the biggest monarch on the continent, uh, a generation before Frederick the Great. Frederick the Great uh, comes to power in Prussia, which is like Northern Germany, um, a, a Northern uh, province of the Holy Roman Empire at this time and takes Prussia from, a pro from being a province, uh, an independent state, you know, in the Westphalian sort of way, uh, sort of understanding of a nation state and uh, then begins to expand it, it into an empire and to uh, begin to co consolidate what what then becomes modern Germany. Okay, a lot of that is due to Frederick the Great uh, consolidating Germany into a, a cohesive uh, identity, national identity. Frederick the Great is, is, a, is a key stage in this. And he was uh, an absolute monarch uh, in the model of feudal lords in a way, but um, as we saw, the whole feudal order had totally broken down uh, by this point. And so we just have these hanger ons like, like Louis XIV. And then uh, ultimately at the end of the century, uh, Louis XVI, who faces the French Revolution, uh, Frederick the Great avoids or, or even cushions the blow of this kind of revolutionary spirit because he is an, uh, an enlightened absolute monarch. Um, so he's one of the, uh, the first monarchs and, and Prussia is one of the first countries to uh, provide like public education and to try to educate the, the population very broadly. And there was lots of uh, social reforms like that, like some, some degree of medical care and education and a lot of flexibility and mobility so that people could, through education, 
get into government offices and have some social mobility up into higher ranks of society, which now higher ranks are not so feudal in structure with like nobility and everything. But as you move up in the government, um, your status sort of progressively gets higher and you could do this over generations through families. Uh, so uh, civil service becomes a, a, big, a big deal. And um, there's a reform of the legal system so that it's more coherent and fairer and uh, more understood by the general public. And, uh, and it's a very bourgeois kind of state liberal state bureaucracy. I, I think liberal is a better word here where um, there is some concern for um, taking care of the poor and, and um, projecting a sense of care for the, for the nation. And Frederick was very good at this. And uh, he was greatly revered. He was a great general on the battlefield. So he, he won lots of battles and people became very patriotic, patriotic in that regard. Um, but he tried to distribute the wealth down to the mass of people in a lot of ways that other monarchs uh, were entirely the opposite. And so he was very popular and, um, and uh, and retain that popularity by being very generous with public resources and better hygiene and, and uh, roads and, and buildings and things like this. Okay, uh, but very centrally controlled. Um, now he's, uh, now this is unbound because he really breaks the peace of Westphalia. He starts taking over other kingdoms and invading the sovereignty uh, of other nation states. And so he really starts to stir the pot uh, of the peace of Westphalia that had existed for, um, for a century at this point. Um, he starts to undo the peace of Westphalia and start to invade other states and take them over, uh, which upsets the order of, of Europe. Okay, um, but nonetheless, he's popular. Uh, Napoleon is a very similar figure and I've talked somewhat about him. We have the French Revolution starting in 1789 and then uh, you know, with this slogan of liberty, equality, fraternity, uh, then we have the first consulate and then the French empire under Napoleon, um, uh, which is like a dictatorial, authoritarian, centralized control, uh, militaristic government, but it's very liberal. Uh, and the Napoleonic code is a, is a good symbol of that uh, where uh, he, totally rewrote the legal code. And it was something that everybody recognized as a, as a better legal code and was adopted all over Europe by other countries because it was uh, so rational and did help to defend the powerless against the powerful in a society. So there's a lot of good here, but it is, uh, you know, but Napoleon is nonetheless a dictator, and um, and so he, you know, he's this enlightened dictator that has a, a strong persona and a lot of personality, and um, and is very popular. And of course, we have the long durée of the bourgeois capitalist revolution. I just want to remind you about because we never even saw the end of the French Revolution. Right, it, it was still ongoing when we when we left off that story. Um, okay, so I'll I'll leave that at that, uh, and this is just kind of building up to Hegel here. Um, 